One of the most important questions on any doctor's mind is the chance of getting into training jobs in specialties like surgery, radiology, anesthesia, cardiothoracic surgery in Australia. And my response is always the same. After getting your general registration and permanent residency, if you're willing to put in three to four years of hard work, lots of on-call work in non-training jobs, research, publication courses, and willing to travel to do some regional and rural jobs whilst trying to get excellent references, then you can get into any specialty. But what about doctors who want to chill out? They're not into years of non-training work, nonsense research. Yes, for those no-nonsense people, there are more mundane specialties. So let's jump into it. Now, all of the data in this video has been taken from Australian Ministry of Health website resources designed for medical students, link in description. So let's start. 12 of the easiest training specialties to get into in 2024 in Australia. Number one, general practice, perhaps the mother of all specialties and arguably the most ancient and least desirable throughout this existence is general practice of family medicine, whatever you want to call it these days. It is for migrant Egyptian and Pakistani doctors who are more interested in business of practice than the actual medicine. It is for lady doctors who prefer to give more time to their families than rather be worried about the CPD requirements. Every year, RACGP takes nearly 6,000 GP trainees in range of its training program across Australia, but there are still hardly enough GPs and nearly 51% of the Australian GP workforce are females. And currently, there are about 24,000 fellows GP working in Australia. Average training time is three years, which includes 12 months of hospital internship, so it's perhaps the shortest of all specialties. General medicine, or more appropriately, acute medicine. These days, in most hospitals where acute medicine physicians are trying to find new ways to stay relevant in rapidly evolving subspecialization in medicine, what do they look after? Pretty much everything. Every patient who's been denied admission by other specialties falls intoxicated delirium pain management, even intracranial hemorrhage, where neurosurgery just won't repeat CT in 24 hours. One of the most undersubscribed field of medicine. They take about 800 trainees annually, and 29% of the workforce is female doctors. And they work on an average about 30 hours per week clinically geriatric medicine along with pediatrics geriatric medicine is perhaps the only age-based specialty the only trouble is pediatrics have got a cut of 16 years geriatrics are still not sure where to limit their age some say it's 80 some say it's physiological age but no one actually knows what the age actually is. I'll be honest with you, I've not seen many young geriatricians. They take about 300 trainees every year, with 52% of their workforce being female doctor. One thing I do ask why they end up taking geriatrics as a professional career choice, their trainees come up with the most genuine and heartwarming stories providing independence to an aging human being whilst providing holistic care. It is almost as if they're saying some sort of conservationalist trying to save an endangered species, but don't Get me wrong, geriatrics have finally found their niche, private sector. Yes, you'll find almost all of the public and private hospital beds occupied with geriatric patients waiting for nursing home placements, which are hardly any. Private hospitals love geriatric patients. As for them, it's like a long-term renter who does not generate huge income, but enough to keep everyone employed in the hospital. You can say it's like a negatively geared investment property, whereby you're losing money to save tax and just feel good at the same time. Emergency medicine. The actual emergency in this medicine is about 30% these days, and 70% is actually caring for out of our GP service. Statistically, more than two thirds of the patients are sent home from every emergency department, which makes one question. Why did they come to emergency in the first place? It is also one of the specialties where we play musical beds. For 200 odd presentations per day, for an average size emergency department, we will only have 50 beds, meaning 150 of our patients will be managed in corridors, chairs, recliners, under streams called fast track or short stay. However, let me assure you, there's nothing fast or short about emergency medicine. In Australia, every year, there are about 1,700 training positions, 30% of which are underfilled for obvious reasons of shift work, lack of private work, and being constantly under unnecessary to do the work fast when there are actually no beds. Surprisingly, nearly 40% are women trainees in emergency department, maybe due to shift work. They find it easy to juggle their family life. Trainees in emergency medicine are typically enthusiastic runners, cyclists, migrant doctors, and GPs who came here for a thrill and excitement and acuteness, 
only to realize it's just another way of seeing patients without the comfort and privacy of their own consulting rooms. Intensive care medicine, perhaps one of the new specialties in Australia with their own college of intensive care medicine. They take about 300 odd trainees per year. I think mainly because of the fact that th there are hardly enough ICUs and the ICUs are more at the district and the regional level hospitals. Most of the doctors here are in Indian or Egyptian anaesthetist and burn out anesthetic surgical registrar or even ED physicians with a passion for an ultrasound plus, trying to do some real medicine. And trust me, there's plenty of real medicine here. In fact, one of my old bosses and I see would like to call themselves as critical care physicians. Let me also advise you on one more thing. In Australia, if you're trying to do ICU for procedures like intubation, central line, arterial lines, then don't. Emergency physicians in Australia do all of that well before even generating an ICU referral. ICU physicians work long hours, approximately 50 hours per week, and training is sweet seven years if you're committed for it. Psychiatry. The other day, I met a psychiatric registrar and I asked him to admit a patient who he completely refused to admit because of the fact the patient had a positive urinalysis with a CRP of 20, 20, 20. They try to see this as a threat to their very clean mental world with zero organic pathology. And on that note, I would like to advise all psychiatrists to stop convincing other specialties that they are still doctors. I think they should just learn from dentists and develop their own little headspace. Psychiatry is most underscribed field in Australia. Their national intake is about 1,700 registrars per year. But where do all of these registrars go? I would love to know because every time I like to get a psychiatry consult, there is a single psychiatric registrar serving half the Eastern Board of Australia with three specialist nurses. 41% of their workforce is women. It seems COVID has really put them in hot demand. They are now growing into the private space with most offering telehealth consultation and charging $700 to $1,000 per one hour consultation. But I can see their work is really documentation intense. What can I say? If minds were a jungle, they'd be like Indiana Jones. Medical oncology. I don't know why this specialty ended up being on this list. They take about 170 trainees per year with 47% of their workforce being women. I was once told that this is a very competitive specialty to gain entry into medical oncology, mainly in the metropolitan areas. But I guess their positions are underfilled in region and rural Australia. Partly also influenced by the fact that by the time the patient gets diagnosed with cancer most of the time is already lost. If you look at it, it's a bad reflection on GPs who couldn't diagnose a patient in the first place. General pathology. They usually train in anatomical pathology, cytology, chemical pathology, microbiology, though not as much in detail in any of these specialties. They take about six trainees nationally per year and still they are undersubscribed. Most pathologists work in metropolitan areas and major hospitals. These folks would be the first one to get knocked off by artificial intelligence. Number nine, palliative care medicine. One of the much needed specialty. They take about 55 trainees nationally and there are only 30 fully trained and qualified palliative care specialists in Australia. 62% of their workforce is female. Number 10, occupational and environmental medicine. They ensure that the regular Bob at Mines and Joe in the railway are fighting fit kind of like gym trainers, but for specific job roles. An occupational physician applies high level of medical skills to the interface between, you know, the person's work and his or her health. They take about 97 trainees per year with 24% of them being female. Lots of practices are operating in private sector, helping industries like mining, railway, and prevention of work-related injuries. If there is specialty for people who party too hard and often too long, then this is addiction medicine. Their gig is pretty much looking after patients addicted to alcohol, opioids, and benzodiazepine, or all three at the same time. They take about 55 trainee doctors per year. Their appointments are highly sought after as they always rebook them at six monthly interval. In between that time, we, as emergency medicine physician, manage acute flare up of pain crisis disguised as chest pain, abdominal pains, pelvic pains by doing unnecessary CT scans, troponin, only to give them more endone and just to get them out of emergency to follow them with their own addiction specialist. Pain medicine. They take only about 55 trainees annually throughout Australia. Their job is mainly to provide acute and chronic pain management, including performing some pain relieving procedure. The only trouble is the management of the pain means that they have long-term relationship with their patient who never will get well and they will never be out of luck of finding a new patient. So there you have it. These are the least wanted and easiest specialists to get into in Australia. But beware, the lack in demand might be because of the location, because of the job in does not provide long-term security and lack of private work and procedures that tend to generate higher income in shorter span of time. 
I hope you like this video. Till next time, look after yourself and each other. Goodbye.